Hey there, hope you're having a wonderful day. In this video, we're going to go over for loops in C++. So for loops are blocks of code used to repeat a task a specific number of times. So in C++, to write a for loop, you need to define three things, and I like to call them three S's. And basically, you need to define a starting point, a stopping condition, and the number of steps. So for instance, I can write a for loop to iterate 10 times. So it would be for int i equals zero. So this is the starting point. And then I will add a semicolon. Then I need to specify a stopping condition. So I want to continue this for loop until i is no longer less than 10. And then the steps would be i plus plus. So this is incrementing i by one every time. And then what I can do is just print out the number. So I can do c out i. Okay, so our starting point is i equals zero. And then we're going to repeat this task of printing out the value of i. And then we increment i by one. And then we check to see if we've reached the stopping point which is i less than 10. So if I save and run our program, you can see we've printed out the numbers from zero to nine. So it starts at zero, and once i reaches 10, 10 is no longer less than 10, therefore it stops printing. And in this case, we are using post increment, but you can also do pre increment. So if I save and run my program, you can see we get the same values. And this is essentially the same as also doing i plus equal one. So if I save and run my program, you can see it is the same thing. So it prints out zero to nine, but it is usually more common to just write i plus plus like so using the post increment, but you don't always have to increment by one. You can also increment by two so this will print out all the even numbers from zero up to 10. So if I save and run my program, you can see we get zero, two, four, six, and eight. And the same applies if you just change this to three. So let's run our program. And you can see we get zero, three, six, nine. Okay. And another thing to note is that with this condition, it stops at nine because nine is the last number that is less than 10. So technically it's doing i less than or equal to nine, but usually when we write for loops, we just do less than because it is more clear that we are stopping at 10. But if you want, you can do i less than or equal to nine. It's up to you. So this is how you can write a for loop to go forwards, but what if you want to go backwards? What if you want to count down? So if you want to count down from nine to zero, you would have to start at nine, so I would do for int i is equal to nine i greater than or equal to zero i minus minus c out i and then let's see out the empty space as well and then n line. So we start at nine and then we use this condition. So while i is greater than or equal to zero we're going to repeat this task of printing i, and then we are going to decrement. So this is the step. So if I save and run my program, you can see the first for loop will give us zero to nine, and then the second for loop will give us nine to zero. All right, so this is how you can write a for loop to count forward and backwards. So one use of a for loop would be to calculate a factorial, and basically n factorial is the product of all numbers from one to n. So for example, three factorial is equal to one times two times three, so this is six. So we can write a for loop to calculate the factorial. So I can do int factorial is equal to one, and then I can specify an n value. So let's say we want three factorial. So the factorial is the product of all numbers from one to n. So if I want to write a for loop, I would do for int i is equal to one. So we start at one and our stopping condition will be i less than or equal to n. 
So in this case, we want to include n in the calculations, and then the steps would be i++. So here I would just do factorial times equal i. And then over here, we can print out n factorial is equal to factorial. So if I save and run my program, you can see 3 factorial is equal to 6. And I can change this number to 5. And you can see 5 factorial is equal to 120. And of course, we can combine this with a user input. So I can overwrite the value of n. So let's say I want a user to input a value. So I would do C out, enter a number, and then C in n. So if I run my program, you can see I can enter 10, and then we get 10 factorial, and this will give us the number. All right, so that's one practical use of a for loop where we go through numbers. And one thing to note here is that this variable that we declared here, this doesn't have to be i, this could be any name. So you can say int num, but the reason why we use i is because we tend to use for loops to iterate through sequences or collections. So for instance, we would use a for loop to iterate through all the values of a vector or all the characters in a string. And so the i would be short for index. So I'm going to create a vector, and to do so, I'm going to include vector over here. And let's say I have a vector of integers, and these are the grades of students in my class. Then I can have values of 87, 85, 98, 100, 77, 94, like so. So let's say I have six students, and these are their grades. I can use a for loop to print out all the values in this vector. So for int i is equal to 0, i less than grades dot size, i plus plus. I can do c out grades i, and then let's do c out end line. So if I save and run my program, you can see we get the values in our vector. Now, one important thing to note here is that in C++, instead of using int, we use the type called size t. So size t is basically an integer, but the difference is an integer can be a negative or positive number. Therefore, if we have a very large vector, an integer might not be enough to represent the size of the vector. Therefore, we use a size t type and this size t is an integer that is unsigned. Basically, it is zero or positive, but it cannot be negative. And another thing about size t is that the maximum value that a size t can hold would be the maximum size of a vector. Therefore, when you are iterating through a vector using the index, you want to use the size t type. Okay, so if I save and run the program now, you can see we get our values over here. And another application for a for loop is that I can use a for loop to modify each value in the vector. So let's say I want to curve the grades of the students and give each one five more points. I can do that with a for loop. So here I'm going to copy and paste this. And then here I'm going to write C out before. And here I'm going to do C out after. So in between, I can write another for loop that will modify the vector. So I can do for size t i is equal to zero, i less than grades dot size, i plus plus, grades i plus equal five. So if I save and run my program, you can see before the change, we have these values. And then afterwards, I've added five to each value in the vector. And another thing that we can add is an if condition to check to see if the grade is already greater than 100. So usually the grade caps at 100, so we shouldn't have 103 and 105. Instead, these two should just be 100. So what we can do here is if grades of i is greater than 100, we're going to set grades i 
to 100. All right, so now if I run the program, you can see for each student, we've given them five more points. And for these two in the middle, because they've exceeded 100 after we add five, we're just going to give them 100. All right, so that's how we can use a for loop to modify the values in a vector. All right, so that is for loops in C++. Now you know how to write a for loop to count forwards and backwards and use a for loop to print out the values of a vector as well as add values or change values in a vector. And if you found this video helpful, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more C++ videos and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.